Well, it's a great day to be up here. I'm very thankful. Um, L2L was very great this weekend, and well, without further ado, let's get started. We have all been ashamed. Now, I want y'all to think about a time you've been ashamed. Well, um, I've been ashamed, of course. One day in English class, I called my English teacher mom before, and uh, that did not go well. Well, we see uh, in Matthew 26, 75, Peter was ashamed. Peter denied Christ three times and then cursed at him while Christ suffered for us. Peter became reluctant and hesitant to share the gospel because he was ashamed. Brothers and sisters, I'm up here today to take a stand for the cause of Christ. In Romans 1.16, we learn, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Today, we want to discover how not to be ashamed in today's society, no matter how much pressure there is. First of all, let's talk about how Christ has become unpopular. In 2 Timothy 4.3, we learn, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having ancient years, they will accumulate for themselves their own passions. Sound doctrine places a burden upon our shoulders to preach the word, even though it may be unpopular. For example, for example, homosexuality has become very popular. Listening to bad music, bad language, and hanging around bad people are all things that have become popular. People will try to drag you into those lures, but we must stand unashamed. 2 Corinthians 10, 2-5 says that the divine power of God's word is able to destroy strongholds like homosexuality. But how will this ever occur if we are afraid to preach the word of God? Secondly, we might be ashamed because our life may not match our message. This reminds me of Moses in Exodus 2, 11 through 14. And if you will, please turn there with me. Exodus 2, 11 through 14. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian feeding a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was then afraid. He thought, surely this thing is known. Notice Moses is trying to promote the goodness of God between two companions, but his encouragement wasn't effective because his life did not match his message. Have we been prevented from preaching the word of God because friends and family know our past reputations? And in this regard, have we been made known for listening to bad music, saying bad words, or hanging around bad people? And so 1 John 2, 6 commands us, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Finally, we don't have to be ashamed because God assures us that we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. This is found in 2 Corinthians 13, 8. We don't have to be afraid when preaching God's word because as the Bible says, it's the power of God unto salvation. It has the power to change the hearts of man. Even though scientists and philosophers try to withstand the truth, they will never be able to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me, Hebrews 13, 6. As we conclude, I find no better exhortation than Philippians 1, 27 to 29. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not finding anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only suffer for him and believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Thank you all for your time. Good evening, brethren. I'm so very glad to, to be here this evening. I was told the song of invitation will be number 555. Uh, in case I have not met you before, I am Hayden Baker. I'm a member at the Brown Trail Church of Christ and a student at the Brown Trail School of Preaching. And all that means is there's a whole lot I don't know, which is all right, because there's a lot to learn. I'm very thankful to be here tonight, uh, thankful to Brother Myron and the elders for allowing me to speak here and hopefully uh, the truth may be preached and I'd be able to do so in a way that is well and pleasing into the sight 
of God. I'd like to start off this evening by recording a story that, that comes from history. There was a merchant from Sidon, and he had this great debt, this great amount of money that was owed to the government. And so back in the ancient world, one of the ways that you could pay off that debt was through different kinds of currency. Specifically, he chose salt because that's one of the currencies that you could pay your debts off in. And so he brought over this great amount of salt from, from Cyprus. So much, in fact, it was enough to, to supply the whole province for, for years. However, he decided that he was going to transfer this to the mountains and hopefully get a better value off the salt if it sat there for a couple years. So he built 65 houses, and he laid the salt within these houses. And it was during this time that the salt started changing. You see, the salt was placed on these earthen floors, these, these floors of dirt. And unlike the salt of today that is pure and what we may call incorruptible, the salt in that day was not the same. So it, after the salt had laid there for some time, the salt became spoiled. It was ruined. It was useless. These large quantities were, were thrown into the road to be trodden under the, the, the foot of men and beasts. It was good for nothing as recorded by the historian. The salt of the ancient world was harvested at least around the Med Mediterranean from the Dead Sea where the salt would be gathered into a large vat and be boiled out. And whenever it was boiled, you were left with this substance that although impure, it was valuable and it was precious. Such a fact becomes highly important whenever we consider the subject of the hour. In Matthew chapter 5, on the Sermon on the Mount, which if you've not already turned over there, please do at this time. Because in Matthew chapter 5, we find Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And in verses 13 through 16, Jesus gives these two illustrations to explain how the disciples should apply the principles that they had just learned in the Beatitudes and how those should be applied to the people in the world around them. So in addressing the teachings of Jesus and the requirements therein, what I want to ask this morning, as after mentioned, the, the main theme being the overall cost of discipleship, what is the cost of a visible, salty discipleship? The, the idea of being salt, the idea of being light, and the idea of being in the world and being tied to Christ. It's easy to forget that this whole beginning section of the Sermon on the Mount pertains to discipleship. You find that in, in verse 1 where we often think that Jesus was just speaking to the multitudes, but it says he was speaking to the disciples, the people who at this point in Jesus' ministry were some of the most faithful and committed people. These are those who were addressed, and these were the people who Jesus was hoping to describe. So in addressing the teachings of Jesus and the requirements, what is the cost of a visible, salty discipleship? I hope to provide four separate applications from verses 13 through 16 that you may be able to take home with you today. Number one, embrace the uniqueness of being a disciple. If you look at how it reads, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And he says, you are the light of the world. When we think about the Lord's church today, how many have embraced the muddied waters of this pseudo-discipleship? The idea of taking on the name of a disciple, yet not the responsibility. The idea of taking on the benefits of a disciple, yet when it comes time to fulfill your necessities, you are simply not there. This pseudo-discipleship, this false discipleship, it's a very easy thing to fall into. But instead of shying away from the uniqueness of being a disciple of Christ, we must embrace it. And here's why. Jesus' disciples alone are God's people. If you look and he, he says two words. He says you and are. Let's focus on that first one. He says you 
Out of all the people in the earth and out of all the people in the world, you alone are the salt in the light. It is debated whether or not in the Greek this is placed in a matter of emphasis, even though it is the first word that is placed there. So perhaps there is extra emphasis to be given. But the idea conveyed here is that it is you alone. You alone are the people who are these elements. You alone are the salt in the light. And even though Jesus was speaking to the multitudes, he was directing this towards his disciples. He points out that these people would be cursed, that they, just like the prophets before, he points out that they'd be slandered for Jesus' sake, and that these people would have the reward in heaven. He continues later in the Sermon on the Mount, he'll say something very similar. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, he'll say, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who are in heaven. So that very closely parallels what he says in verse 12. Forgive me. Yes, verse 12, where he says, For great is your reward in heaven. He's speaking to the disciples and the uniqueness therein. And then he says, are. He says, you are. Jesus' disciples are supposed to be the tools by which the kingdom is spread. Jesus doesn't say you have. He doesn't say you teach. He doesn't say you have been nor you will be the salt or the light. He says you are. He the salt of the earth in the light of the world. Whatever purpose these two elements have, it has not already been done for you, nor is it a burden that you are to cast on someone else. It is your burden because you are. So therefore, the question must be asked, what is your purpose? If the point that Jesus is making by bringing up these two elements is that both these elements have purpose in their own regards. What is the purpose? Well, he says salt adds flavor. And contextually speaking, I believe this most accurately refers to the principles in the identifications that Jesus had just made in the verses prior, the Beatitudes, all the blesseds what he had just made, the calling to which he called these people to act like. A lot of the times, whenever I think about the, the qualities of salt, we can very easily start majoring in minors and minoring in majors. Because even though there are all these different qualities of salt and all the different qualities of light, I don't know if that's the primary emphasis that Jesus is making here, although it is an application to be made. I think the primary emphasis that Jesus is making here is that salt has a purpose. And then importantly, which we'll get to in a second, that purpose cannot be fulfilled. That purpose has the ability to not be fulfilled. You can lose that purpose if you don't properly cultivate it. Salt adds flavor. A disciple must partake in the characteristics of the beatitude. And then he says light. Light is there to be seen. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So how do we make sense of this? Well, perhaps consider the sun and the moon. The sun is the greater light, the moon is the lesser light, and the moon gets its light from the sun. So without the sun being there, as the greater light that it is, the moon can have no light. But even still, the moon is just a reflection of the greater light that exists. Our presence ought to reflect the light of Christ in all that we do. That is being the light of the world. Brethren, we must accept the uniqueness and the purpose of being a disciple. Just from the words, you are. Which leads us to our second point. Fear the possibility of becoming useless. Within the beginning part of this sermon, this is one of the only points that Jesus makes that's taken in a negative tone. And likewise, I think it's very appropriate to also apply this in the more negative sense. See, some have bought into the idea that we can't lose our salvation nor our title as a Christian, but Jesus didn't seem to think so. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, 
how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be trampled under by the foot of men. It's good for nothing. Jesus' disciples become useless when they know what to do, yet fail to live up to the standard. If you, look in, if you do look in the Greek, you'll find that the words that are rendered here to lose its flavor is the word marino. In the now form, it can mean to be dull, sluggish, silly, or flat. But here, it's meant to be insipid, the idea of not having flavor. However, if you go down to verse 22, Jesus will talk, use the same word in describing the man when he says, you fool. This word in many other contexts carries the idea of being foolish or making one a fool. So Jesus could very well be using a play on words and saying, if you do not carry out your purpose, you are foolish. And what a warning that is. If a disciple's identity is tied to salt, then just like tasteless salt, a disciple who does not fulfill these requirements is useless. If we were to look at these specific requirements, a disciple's job, according to the Beatitudes, would be to be lowly in character, treat sin seriously, be gentle, seek God, show mercy, remain clean from sin, be peaceful, and be persecuted for the sake of the kingdom, each sermons within themselves. All so important to the discipleship of Christ and the cost therein. James chapter 2, verse 18. But someone will say, you have works. You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe and do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Ultimately, faith without works is dead. For someone as a disciple to be salt, if they know that they have a purpose to fulfill and fail to carry out that purpose in a diligent manner, it's like tasteless salt. But there's another phrase that Jesus adds in there as well. He says, how shall it be seasoned? In other words, can bad salt be salted in order to make it good? Certainly not. No one can force another disciple to be faithful. There is no outside force that can do the job of a disciple for you. If a disciple becomes useless, another disciple cannot make one that, that one be useful against their will. If disciple A over here says, I'm not going to fulfill the purpose described within the Beatitudes, no matter how hard disciple B tries, they can't make disciple A do their job. Now, this is completely set apart from the encouragement that we as Christian brethren should give each other, which is absolutely an important principle but this is about personal responsibility. Purpose must be fulfilled. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ to bring to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. But we must accept the cost of personal responsibility when we put Christ in order to receive those blessings. We must individually live out those beatitudes so we do not lose our saltiness. Which then leads us to point number three. We've discussed the uniqueness of being a disciple of Christ, and we've discussed the possibility of not being able to fulfill that purpose. But now there's a third principle. In verse 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Sacrifice the safety of privacy. In order to be proper disciples, we have to sacrifice the safety of privacy. Sometimes we as Christians can dwell around this, this veil of quietness or conformity so as not to ruin our reputation from the world. I think Brother Houston brought it up earlier whenever he brought up the idea of what's popular not always being right, what's right not always being popular. It's a very true thing, but sometimes we can want to hide behind that veil, hide in the shadows of the world so that we're not truly set apart. But pointing back to, to point one, we must be unique, and that's going to involve the sacrifice of our privacy. It is impossible to be entirely faithful and to be entirely secret at the same time. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Many of the cities in Judea were built on the tops or the sides of hills. And perhaps Jesus, when even giving this lesson, he perhaps he could have pointed to one of them. You can only imagine if you were standing there what that may have looked like. If you were to draw the modern application, think about the purposes of steeples or signs. They are built so that people's attention are drawn to them. Jesus makes the point that you can't avoid these cities. They are visible from all around. So just like a city cannot be hidden, if you go down to verse 15, light ought not to be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. If I am a disciple of Christ, and we are the light, and therefore our lives are exposed. This does not mean I tell everyone about my political agendas, my family gossip, or whatever's on my mind. There's absolutely a lesson in there for being slow to speak and having control of the tongue. What this is in regards to is a being public regarding my religious allegiance to Christ. I cannot remain quiet about that. Just like the parable of the sower and how the seed being the word of God will be received by those around me. Whenever me as a light affects other people around me, people will answer in different ways. According to Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, some will cause contemplation. For others, this will mean persecution for those who share their light. But as was just established, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But he continues, Jesus' disciples must do the opposite and make Christ known as much as possible. Not only do we forego our silence of religion, but we actively put ourselves in a place where Christ can be seen the most. He says, nor do we light a lamp and put in a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. A candlestick is kept out of the basket, but it's put on the lampstand. Brethren, we have a much greater chance of affecting someone with the gospel over the seat at a coffee table than we do in the comment section on Facebook. We must be smart in the way that we make our lights known. We must actively strategize the best way to give light to all who are in the house. Live a life of boldness, proclaiming Christ to all and doing so in the most expedient way possible, the best way possible. Which then leads us to our final point. A disciple of Christ is unique. A disciple of Christ must fulfill their purpose. They lose their privacy, and they need to live the life of an evangelist. How easy is it for us to lose our mission, the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching these things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We must be there for other people. And within shining this light, there are two qualifications. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus' disciples must be people of good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What do good works look like? There's that subject could go in so many different places, even within the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 41 of chapter 5, he'll talk about those who go to second mile. In verse 44, he'll talk about those who love their enemies. If we wanted to go back to James, we could talk about those who practice pure and undefiled religion, which before God the Father is this, to treat the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If our lives are full of good, of good works, then there is no shame needed when our lives are exposed because we have nothing to hide. And then secondly, Jesus' disciples glorify God in all that they do. 
We don't shine our light so that people would praise us, but rather that they would praise God. If you continue within the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 6, verse 1, he'll talk about those who do their charitable deeds before men. In verse 5, he'll talk about those who fast to be seen by men, those who pray to be seen by men. He says that ought not to be so. Do so for your Father, not for the people around you. We must learn humility in making God known. When we talk about Christ, if people come away with, wow, they're a really righteous person, then brethren, we've done something wrong. However, if people come away with, wow, look how much Christ loves me. Look at how much Christ has done to save my soul. Look at how much Christ has helped that person in their lives then maybe we're on the right track. Make Christ known in the way you live your life. But whatever you do, do not let your light get in the way of Christ's light. A follower of Jesus who doesn't live like a disciple is like tasteless salt or invisible light. However, to those who are tasteful salt, invisible light, to borrow the words of Scripture, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Accept the cost of discipleship by fulfilling your purpose. If you have listened to the lesson tonight and you realize that you're not a disciple of Christ and you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, why tarryest thou any longer? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Wander of a New Testament, you have been called to assume the greatest title that man can obtain, and that is Christian, a follower of Christ. I know many of us here this evening have already put on Christ in baptism, but maybe you realize that you haven't been the disciple that you need to be. Maybe you realize in some ways you're like tasteless salt or invisible light. For as long as we are here on this earth, it is not too late to make that change, brethren. All so that you may one day hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. If there are any concerns in your heart this evening, come now as we stand and sing.